Good evening, everybody. I've said good morning to about five people already because I'm just used to saying good morning in this building. But uh, it's dark outside, so I should say good evening. But it's good to have you guys here. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, those of you guys that are watching online, glad to have you guys too. Uh, when we were planning these classes back in the fall, you know, isn't those those beautiful days where it seems like the world was opening up and things were going back to normal. And then who knew that January would be the way it was. And so we're just really grateful that um, as many of you guys are here as you can be and that we had the opportunity to put it online for those who couldn't be here either. I would say again, feel free, spread out as much as you want to. But we're gonna spend uh, the next couple hours together walking through this thing that we call Core 4. And it's one of the slides up here when I keep hitting the button. It will be there. There we go. Uh, core four, something that we're calling foundational discipleship for the people of Cornerstone. And that's what we wanna do over these times once a month over the next, uh, I guess, five months, including tonight, is just kind of lay that foundation, lay a foundation both for our own discipleship and for the way that we wanna help walk with others. Um, and to that degree, uh, again, these are intro classes. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by these being more of an introduction, just kind of like a primer coat um, in this, this lifelong process that we wanna be about together. Um, the way we'll kind of structure the night is we'll spend probably about 40, 50 minutes walking through th some stuff. Um, we'll take some time for questions and then take a break for about 10 minutes or so and then come back for another 40, 50 minutes and that will be the way we do the night. And each, each month when we get together, we'll structure it kind of similarly. There's kind of a part one and part two. Um, hopefully this will be helpful to you. Feel free to take notes. If you have questions, uh, let me know when we have some question time and we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll get cracking together. Sound good? All right, let me pray for us and we'll be off. Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, thank you for our health. I know uh, many of us, even just being over in our children's ministry this morning after an unplanned month off, it's just so grateful for the volunteers that, uh, that serve in our children's ministry and the families. And thank you, Lord, for leading us through the, the, the uncertainty of the last couple of weeks and the chance that we have to be together tonight. Lord, what I'm gonna to begin to share, you know, has been things that, that you've put on my heart that I've wrestled with you, that we as a pastoral and an elder team have wrestled with over the last uh, couple years, several years, and the chance to get to um, begin this process with probably the biggest group that we've done this with so far. Lord, I am excited about it. But Lord, as you've taught me so many times throughout my life already, um, as much as I might wanna do things perfectly, I have yet to do something perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, that you are the perfect one. And even as we as small, finite people seek to wrap our heads around your story and your mission and the role that you've given us in that, Lord, would you help us to embrace our smallness, that calling to be lifelong learners, because we can't wrap our minds around all of it right now, but we get to keep walking with you in that relationship of trust and then helping others to walk with you as well. So would you guide us in that way, Lord Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen. So before we jump into really, because uh, tonight the theme of our evening is to just kind of walk through a big overview of what is this thing that we call core for and why do we feel like it's so essential. But before we do that, what I want to do is I want to take a little bit of time to remind you of some of the stuff that we covered last fall when we were in our membership series, because even what we laid out in our membership series, the definition of discipleship, a discipleship pathway really is what core four is meant to fit as a part of. So if you will, rem I wanna remind you of this. This hopefully is something that is very familiar to most of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus gives us his commission. And guys in the back, uh, Doug, I don't know if it's possible for me to see those slides on this screen. That would be awesome if I can. But if not, I'll read them here. Jesus says this, this is after his resurrection. He has gone to a mountain in Galilee. The disciples have come to meet him there. This is the risen Jesus about to be ascended to the right hand of the Father. And these are in many ways his parting words to his disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I rule as king over all of it. So therefore go and what does it say? Make disciples of who? of all nations, all the peoples of the earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, to keep, not just to know about, not just be able to quote to others or write it on a, on a, on a handy little coffee mug or journal or something like that, but to observe what I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always 
to the end of the age. This is the mission of the church, to make disciples of all nations. And like we walked through in the fall, to whom did Jesus give this mission to make disciples? He gave it to a group of disciples. So do with others what I've done with you. And the, the, the idea that we connected there was that the idea of being a disciple of Jesus and making disciples of Jesus go hand in hand, that you cannot separate the two from each other. And that really was the central idea of what we talked about when we talked about membership, was it's the, the stated commitment, not, not an assumed commitment, like, oh yeah, we're cool, right? But the stated formalized commitment that says, yes, I want to be a disciple who's engaged in making disciples in partnership with this local church. We talked about how this definition of discipleship that we put together is this, a disciple is a follower of Jesus who is first learning from Jesus, not just any other Christian teacher. We can have favorite Christian teachers and, and preachers and people from church history that we can learn a ton from, but all of it is to be engaged in our discipleship of Jesus himself. We are learning from him. We are trusting Jesus which includes both believing him, believing what he says, and then obeying him. It's, a, it's an obedience of faith that Paul talks about in the book of Romans. And not only are we following him and trusting what he says, but we are actually, uh, 2 Corinthians 3 tells us, being transformed into the image of Jesus. He's, we are becoming like Jesus. And what wraps it all together is this idea is to be one who follows Jesus, who trusts him, who learns from him, who's becoming like him, is to be engaged in helping others in that same process. But how do we do that? How do we move along this process of becoming like Jesus and helping others do the same? This is where we walked through in that membership series, what we called our discipleship pathway, that breaks down to these three big ideas of connect, commit, and call. That what we wanna do is we want to connect people to Jesus. He's the one we're following but that none of us are created to follow Jesus as Lone Ranger Christians. There are no Lone Wolf Christians, but instead to connect to a group of disciples who you can now follow Jesus with and the way that those group of disciples come under the care and guidance of a local church. And then from that, then we invite and say, it seems like you've connected with Jesus. It seems like you wanna follow him together with us. Come commit to that with us. Commit to Jesus by going through the waters of baptism that shows you've left that old life behind and, you, and you've begun this new life in Jesus. Commit to be a disciple in a local church through, that's again, that's what we were after with this idea of church membership. Yes, I want to be a disciple within this church. Now that's not necessarily a life sentence. God can move us on and move us to different places. But a sense of, I don't want to float anonymously through my church. I want to be known and I want to know those who are leading me and be intentional in the way we go about doing this. And then with that, this is a sense of, okay, now that you are a disciple, let's equip you to be a disciple maker. And then we, because we want to unleash you in the sense of calling in the places where, and with the people with whom God sent you, according to the gifts and the passions that God's given you, and in proportion to your maturity and your capacity in a given season of life. That's the pathway we want to take people down. And you may remember us sitting up here, uh, Todd and I, and we talked about how this pathway is kind of like a mall map. Remember that? We said, where's the big red you are here dot that helps you to orient yourself on this pathway? And what I wanna make clear from you as we jump into more what core four is, is where's the big red dot in regard to core four? And I would say it's right here. We said for those who commit through membership at Cornerstone, there's two main ways that we wanna equip you. We said through this idea of core four, this foundational biblical foundation for life and ministry, and through service, through hands-on active service to one another and to the community around us in the name of Jesus. Those were kind of the, the, the right leg and the left leg of how we make progress on this discipleship pathway. And so what I wanted to say is that first and foremost, thank you to those who are our members who are here. Like you've said that you want to be here and you wanna be a part of this with us. And so this is one of the key ways that we do wanna walk with you. And so thanks so much for being here and being a part of it. I hope that this is beneficial to you. But as, as you'll see, even though like I kind of put that red circle around this equipping phase of the pathway, 
What we're going to talk about in core four, it kind of informs the whole pathway from start to finish. And so that's where I would say, if you're a disciple of Jesus, if you're not a member yet here at Cornerstone, I'm so glad that you're here too, because I hope that as we walk together in these times over these Sunday nights, that this helps to clarify for you what it is we're driving after as a local church, the way that we as your, as your elders and leaders want to lead you. So that way you can say, yeah, I, I, I do want to join you in this commitment. Or even on the other hand, yeah, you know, if this is kind of clarified, maybe this isn't the church that I want to, to commit myself to. And in that case, as we've said throughout this process, we'd love to then help you find a local church, again, whether in this area or someone else that you can find a home in, that you can be committed to. So again, see how this whole thing fits into what we've been walking through as a church. Any questions about that before I move on? Okay. Yeah, Jeff. That's a great question. Yeah, he, uh, if you, on, online, uh, Jeff was just asking if these slides will be available. And yeah, we will make them available uh, probably after this. As a matter of fact, because I'll, I'll probably reference this a couple times, um, there's a, a new page on the church website. If you go to cornerstonesemi.com and you go to resources, right, Kim? I think it's resources. There's a tab under there that says core four, where you can both find links that has information about these classes. And that's also where the videos that we're recording tonight um, are going to be as well. So that way, if you're not able to be here in person or you want to watch it later, it'll be there. And that's where we can put it. We'll, we'll just try, keep loading that with a lot of the information about this. So great question. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. What I want to do now is I want to move on a little bit more to talking about what do I mean by calling these core four intro classes, that it's an introduction to core four, that it's kind of just that first primer coat. You sand the surface, you get that first primer coat down, but you're not done yet, right? There's a couple more layers of the actual finish paint that you, paint that you need to put on. So keep that in mind as we do this. This is a way to get us started. The, the main goal over these nights is to introduce you to the main concepts and categories that we'll be walking through in core four so that you're aware of them, that, that you become familiar, that almost having these categories in your mind, what we can keep doing is just coming back through and adding more content into those categories. There's a big part of what we're gonna do. This just, um, I, I found for myself as someone who grew up in the church, Bible college, seminary, all that kind of stuff, there's so much information that I had and I needed a way to like defragment the hard drive. Give me something simple so that way I have an easy way, a mind map, if you will, to organize a lot of this information. And this is stuff that's been useful in my life and as we've worked through it as a pastoral staff. And so keep that in mind. What I wanna do is give you those basic categories and we'll keep adding content. We'll keep adding layers of understanding to that. My, my goal is that during these times, through this time together, you'll be able to pick up on these concepts as you interact with different people and different groups in the life of this church. Whether it's when Todd or myself or someone else, else is up here preaching on a Sunday, in the conversation you're having in a community group, um, if you're serving in our children's ministry and our student ministries, you start to go, ah, I see, I catch it. Oh yeah, that sounded like the biblical story or that sounded like gospel transformation. Um, if you will, it's almost like learning to recognize flavors in different kinds of food. Like I remember when I first started getting into more like um, uh, sushi or Thai food or things like that. And all of a sudden I went, oh, ginger's not just for like Christmas cookies. Like you can use that same flavor in a totally different way. And as a matter of fact, it can really light you up, which I didn't know. I'd never, then I remember one time having like a ginger snap that was like a ginger snap. And it was like, wow, I've never had a cookie that made me sweat before, right? <laughs> but but I, I was able to pick up on that same flavor in different types of food. And in, in a way, that's kind of my hope for you as well. It's not just so that you can just go, oh, I love that, me that one meal and I'm gonna eat it every day and have the same thing over and over again but that you learn to appreciate the way these same four ideas kind of permeate so many different things so that you can, you can see the trends, you can see the commonality, and even like, like someone who's um, uh, getting pretty good at cooking, you can start to be creative with those flavors yourselves and make new combinations that, that are a blessing and bring joy to others. That you can move from, what, what is that thing I'm tasting? To, oh, I know what that is that I'm tasting. To, I have an idea of how to use this in a, in a way to bless and serve others. Does that make sense? So again, that's the 
purpose of core four is to, to not just help you be able to appreciate these concepts when myself or somebody else uses them, but to equip you to be able to use these, to, to have them be useful enough that they're kind of in your own back pocket for the way that you walk through your own life as you disciple others, as you interact, as you parent, as you, as you uh, interact with your spouse and so forth. Again, like the idea is not just learning how to enjoy good food, but teaching you how to cook, if you will. Think of these like cooking classes, that if it just stays at that level of like watching a cooking show on TV of, ooh, that looks good. Or even just going to a restaurant where you get to taste what somebody else has prepared. No, what we want to move toward is this idea of let's get our hands dirty. Let's get in there. Let's get in the kitchen. Let's make a mess. Let's accidentally use salt instead of sugar and find out what that does to the recipe, right? The trial and error of actually learning how to do this. That's why the main way that we want to walk people through, walk, walk our members through core four down the road is not just in a larger introductory class setting like this, but, but in much more of like a small group of maybe five to 10 people that'll meet probably a couple of times a month over maybe the better part of a year to even two years. Over, over a longer span of time that would allow you to go more in depth into both scripture and your relationships with each other so that you actually do begin to see each other's gifts and passions come to the surface. That you actually do begin to see, um, you can chart each other's growth. Oh man, I remember when we were in the first couple months of this and this was a real sticking point from you. And now I see how not only do you understand it, but it's connected this dot and that dot and that dot and pushed you along further. But that's much more the, the, the idea is that at the end of that, you're able to then dive into discipleship with others with these four elements as kind of the foundation for you. Again, whether that's discipleship through service in the church or in other areas of our community, or even God takes you some other place on this globe, or whether you now become more of like a teacher leader who says, yeah, what I wanna do is I wanna get a group of people and walk them through these concepts that were transformative for me. Either way, the point is that this is an introduction to what hopefully down the road will be something more in depth. Some of you might already be in a group like that. As a matter of fact, I would say one of the unique things about this thing called Core 4 is that probably very different from the history of Cornerstone, we had these ideas like four or five years ago and rather than announcing them the next Sunday, we took some time to think through them and wrestle through them and wrestle through them as a pastoral staff. Um, we've even had some different test groups that have worked through them together. And, and in some ways, I think that's, that's partly where you, you'll, you'll, you'll hopefully see a good tenacity where we're not going, oh, let's give it a try. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. We're going, no, we truly believe in this and we really wanna move in this direction. And some of you guys might be in a mentorship group or something like that that's already, you're already getting to dive into this. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm really glad that you're still here for these intro classes because my hope is, again, if we do something like this on a somewhat maybe annual basis, even for those of us that get to engage in it more in an in-depth way, this is almost like a little refresher, a chance to come in and be reminded, oh yes, that's right. Catch the rhythm, catch the melody of the, of the song that we're trying to play together. Maybe even something that helps to realign you if you kind of go, oh, I started drifting off. Let me remember what's the main thing that we're shooting after. And just be something, be, be something that really helps us to, to stay together. So again, that's the big why of where we want to go with Core 4. And these intro classes are just to get us started in that direction. Any questions thus far? Thoughts, comments, concerns? I had a professor who used to say shouts of outrage, things like that. Okay. Let me walk through one more thing with you guys, and then we'll, we'll start jumping into Core 4 itself. And it's more of this, what, what do we, okay. I don't know about you as someone who um, uh, been around the church for quite a few years, I, I get a little bit like suspicious of things that sound like pithy and cutesy and acronyms. I grew up as a kid in the nineties in the church where everything had an acronym. Every ministry was an acronym for something. And so there's even a part of it for me that kind of bristled against like putting a, a, a cute little, or like a, a short name to what we're trying to do here. But it was really helpful as we'd be batter, uh, batting it around as a pastoral staff to just have a name for it. And what I found was we kept talking about, okay, there's these four core things. And I think it was actually Terry Earwood at one point who just goes, why don't you just call it core four then? And I was like, okay, that'll work. Okay, we'll work with that. Okay, so where did this come from? Again, so let me, let me take you back. Let me tell you a little bit of a story. I don't know about you. Like we'll talk a lot about story in our time together and story does help provide context for what we're doing. 
So I've uh, been on staff here at Cornerstone since I was a senior in college in 2005. I was a youth intern, did youth ministry for a while, led our children's ministry for a while. And then about eight years ago, um, I I transitioned my role from leading our children's ministry into uh, the current role that I've been in since then. The the title is Equipping Pastor. And I remember uh, when Todd and I were first talking about this change, he said to me, he's like, he said, I view your, your role on the team as almost like a tinker. Like you, you've got your workshop and we can come to you and say, hey, Christian, I need something that can help me do this with the people that I'm leading, whatever that, that thing might be. And then what you do, you kind of go back in the workshop and you tinker around, you find what's out there, you review different things, maybe put some together if there isn't something that does that and then bring it to us. And I went, Okay, yeah, that, I mean, I, I, I like problem solving. I like kind of starting with a blank slate and seeing what comes. And sure, I'll give it a, I'll give it a crack. And um, we tried a lot of things over the last eight years and done a bunch of different things, learned a lot by trial and error, started things, stopped things, um, restarted things, refreshed things. And I would say it was probably about three or four years in this role after there was a lot of things that we'd rolled out and got started that I started to notice what I guess you'd call um, like two main drawbacks in a lot of what I was putting together at that point. One of the drawbacks would just be as I looked at our church as a whole and especially the way that we tried to walk with people and train people. Um, a lot of what we did tar- started or it tended to just kind of camp out in much more of a practical level. Especially maybe in some of our more like 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 programmatic ministries, like in children's ministry or student ministries, or even sometimes leading a community group, most conversations, here's how you lead a community group. And and the golden $50 million question, what do you do with kids in a community group? Or uh, in children's ministry, here's how you teach a lesson, or here's how you make sure the kids don't take too much snack or whatever whatever it might be. Here's how you check them in. Here's how you lead a small group. It was very how-to oriented. In some ways that's important because you know what I've learned? Sunday keeps coming whether you're ready or not. And so you need people who kind of have an idea of how to do the the things you need to do. But again, the drawback in it, not all bad, but I guess you could say, you know, the phrase, what's the baby in the bathwater? The bathwater of the whole thing was so much of that equipping tended to just focus on here's how you do a thing and not as much how are you continuing to grow in your own faith? And not only that, how, how do I come alongside you and help you to grow in maturity as well? That led to kind of maybe the other drawback that I started to notice, not just here at Cornerstone, but I think kind of by and large at at churches around America, is that so often the kind of equipping that we offer tends to have more of like a buffet mentality to it, which is basically here's a whole bunch of options. Does anything sound good to you? What might strike a chord with you? If, If out of all of this, this one sounds good, feel free to ignore everything else and do this one, right? Which, again, isn't necessarily all bad. There, there is a huge part, and I think all of us could talk about in our lives those times where there was like a felt need or a question that we needed to answer. Like, for instance, we've done a lot of marriage classes over the years here at Cornerstone. And you know what? If you're looking to get married, marriage suddenly becomes a really relevant topic of discussion, right? If you're realizing marriage ain't all puppy dogs and rainbows, again, Marriage becomes a really relevant discussion and that can be super helpful. But I would say this, that kind of buffet line mentality, it can leave a lot of blind spots unaddressed and unnoticed. If you're just led by what sounds interesting to me, you can miss things that actually might be even more foundational and essential because it didn't, it just didn't strike you. You didn't walk by it and go, ooh, yeah, I want that, right? So so that was where... um, and I would also say that kind of buffet line mentality, it's still, again, in a buffet, you don't do the work to prepare the food. You just walk up to stuff that's already made and take what looks good to you. And it can kind of keep it in that sense of pastors like myself saying, here's what I prepared. Do you want it? But not necessarily pushing forward to that stance of, hey, come cook something with me. Let's make something that we can use to bless others. And so that was where, again, like three or four years ago now, I kind of hit the pause button on a lot of the equipping classes and a lot of the different things that we were doing. And I just said, let's take some time to really just read and pray and talk together as a pastoral staff, as elders, and just go, okay, if we were to start over, is this the way we would do it? 
If, if we were to just start from scratch, how would we want to equip people? Again, not just to come and enjoy certain things, but uh, truly equip people in that, in that heart to be disciples who make disciples. We started to even just ask that question of each other. What are, the, what are the tools that we use every day? Not like that specialty little jig that you use for that one project that one time when you made that one thing, but like the trusty hammer that you use on every job, right? Like whether you're counseling someone or teaching or teaching or leading a small group or a community group or, or just in your own life and marriage and parenting, what are the things we just keep coming back to? And then how do we make those tools accessible for our people? Now, again, not just create environments where you can come watch us use the tools, but come get your, hand, get these on your, your hands on these two. Work with us and start to see how useful. Take it out for a spin and see how useful and practical it is for yourself. And so it was as we were talking and praying and wrestling through that, that was where our, our conversation started to coalesce around these four core elements that Terrian in his way said, let's just call it core four. We were looking for something that would be simple enough that we could implement it in our children's ministry, but still like substantial enough that you can keep layering it on, that, that it, would, it would help us to, to, to foster the culture that we want here at Cornerstone, that we're lifelong learners. None of us have arrived. One of the most dangerous things in your Christian life is to think you've arrived. I love the way that Paul talks about it in Philippians where he goes, I know I haven't arrived yet, so I'm straining forward to the upward call of God. I'm forgetting what what came behind. I'm striving on. And then he ends and he says, and so all y'all in Philippi who are mature, think like that. Think like you haven't arrived yet and let's go for it. The mark of maturity is ongoing pursuit. So we wanted something simple that we could use with kids and substantial that would drive us to be lifelong learners and, and comprehensive enough that, that again, whether you jump into our children's ministry, student ministry, lead a community group, serve it, uh, counseling uh, pregnant women at the, at, the, at the community pregnancy clinic or, or, or go someplace overseas as a representative of, of our church, like, the same foundation, the same tools would be useful to you. And so that's where these four components that we started to call for, core four came together. And this is kind of what they are. And this is what we'll be spending the rest of our time walking through. The biblical story, this idea of gospel transformation, how does the gospel change us? Basic doctrine, how does it teach us truth about all of life? And then this idea of mission and evangelism. The purpose is to kind of hold the two of those together. What's the mission that God's given us? And what is our role as proclaimers of good news in that mission? We batted around a lot and we said, okay, is there anything we're missing? Is there like a fifth one that we need? And we really did feel like, again, whatever it may be, you wanna get into counseling, this gives you a foundation for that. You wanna get into justice work and addressing issues in our world, this, again, will give you a good foundation for that. Whatever it might be, we felt like this was simple enough and yet comprehensive enough that, okay, good. These are, this is the, the uh, essential material that we wanna walk people through. And most other things would just be layering on top of that. And so what I wanna do is uh, we're, I'm gonna t- take a break. I'll, I'll give a little bit of time for questions at first. And then I'm gonna give us just a little bit of a break. And then we'll come back and we'll spend our time kind of walking through. I'm gonna give you an overview of each of those four things and then give you a a sense of what we'll be doing in the coming months. So uh, before I do that, yeah, any questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah. The address on the, for the website. So, the website is cornerstonecme.com. And then you'll see a banner on the top of that. And one of the words on that banner is resources. So you click on resources and that drops down a menu and you'll see core four right there and all the materials will be right there. So cornerstonecme.com, resources, core four. Good question. Yeah, question over somewhere. Billy, do you see who it is? Oh, yes. If someone asks questions, yes. So Fred just asked uh, where to find that core four page on the website. And so, yeah, good call. Cool. Actually, I'm looking at the time. We're doing all right. Can I walk you through the first one that's kind of the central, like the, main, like the, the one where we start, and then we'll take our break? Okay, good. That would be fun. 
Um, one of the things I'm gonna encourage you to get at the break, um, we'll have them out in the lobby, is we have these little core four books. These we put together in 2020, right before the pandemic hit. And so they've been in a box in one of our offices kind of since then. Um, but there's also a PDF version on that same uh, core four page of the website. Uh, I'd encourage you, we, don't, we only have a limited number of these. So maybe if you're here with your spouse or something like that, maybe pick one per household or something like that. But um, when we come back from the break, this will be helpful to you as we keep going through the rest of these. Um, there's also some of the membership booklets back there at the resource table. Um, so we'll, we'll come to those in just a second. But let me do this first. When we talk about this, there, the, I guess you could say, you could look at these four things of core four as like four legs of a stool, which conveniently enough, the, the chair I'm sitting on kind of has that right now. Um, or the idea is if you pull any one of these out, uh, the, the structure loses its stability. You, you kind of need the four of them to hold together. But there's probably a, an analogy that I think is even more apt and kind of what we, we started to use was just the analogy of a solar system that with, within these four elements, they're all essential, but there's one that kind of is the gravitational center for everything else. And the one that's kind of the sun at the center of the solar system is this one that we call the biblical story. And this is really what the, the if core four is foundational discipleship, I guess you could say the biblical story is the foundation for, for all of core four. And so that's what we'll be coming back next month to really spend our time on. But um, this is where, where everything starts. And here's something you gotta understand, because this, um, this is something that's come up a lot over the years. We've been talking about this idea of a biblical story, the story of God, the overarching biblical narrative, uh, whatever words we've used. And one of the things we've, we've repeatedly needed to address is when we talk about the biblical story, when we talk about the Bible as the story of God, it's not a gimmick. It's not a pithy, cute way of presenting the Bible to people who are unfamiliar with it. I have become more and more convinced that when we talk about the Bible as a story, we do that because that's what the Bible is. Yes, it is a collection of 66 books written by 40 plus authors over 1,500 years. But the genius of this book is that all 66 of those books fit together to tell one comprehensive, unified story of who God is, of his character, of his actions and purposes in the world. It tells the story of who we are and how God created us to live in relationship with him and how that got messed up and how it can be made new again and how it's going to end. The, the Bible is a story. And so we're not seeking to be cutesy. What we are seeking to do is we believe that the best way to understand the Bible and put it into practice is by paying careful attention to the, the story structure of the Bible. We believe that the best way to understand each book of the Bible is, yes, of course, by, by good biblical interpretation principles, observing and uh, interpreting the text faithfully in its historical context and all of those things. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I highly recommend uh, the class that EBC does on, uh, oh gosh, now I'm blanking on what it's called. Dan, what's it called? Bible study methods. Thank you. I looked at you and I remembered. You just, you just look, you, you, yeah. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. <laughs> They have a great class called Bible Study Methods that helps you to work at that specific level of book and passage and everything. But we, we believe the best way even to understand each of the books of the Bible is by seeing the way that it fits into the story of the Bible and even more particularly where it fits in the story. You may have a favorite book of the Bible, but do you know how it fits? Right? I still remember with my kids... Um, my boys, a few years ago, taking them through the original Star Wars trilogy for the first time. We all know that phrase, that quote, Obi-Wan never told you about your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. What does he say? What is it? Sean knows it. No, I am your father. And Luke freaks out and gets his hand cut off and jumps down the thing and big, big hole to do, right? How impactful would that moment be if that's all you saw of Star Wars? Who's this weird black guy in a black getup? Why is this whiny kid freaking out? What are these weird light up uh, fluorescent tubes they're waving around, right? You wouldn't get all of it. 
But when you set that scene in the big story, you go, oh my gosh, this is huge. Where is this gonna go? Where are these characters gonna end up, right? You, you see that scene within the whole. And that's what we mean when we say we wanna understand each part of the Bible within the whole. We wanna see how it fits together because otherwise what we really will not just have the, the temptation to do, but we're almost relegated to do is to chop this book up into fun, cutesy little bits that we put on coffee mugs, that we put on journals, that we put on t-shirts because it fits our story. It fits the way that, you know, that verse just really spoke to where I'm at in my life right now. It may. And very often God's word does speak very powerfully to where we're at in our lives right now. But I will tell you this, God's word speaks most powerfully when you step back and start trying to fit it into your life and instead see the grand scope of what God is doing in this world and say, God, how do I come be a part of that? How do I fit my life into your story? So not only do we believe that the best way to understand the Bible is in the context of the story, in each book of the Bible, we believe that the best way to understand ourselves and our world and those around us in the same way as we've often talked about is by taking this book and putting it on like a set of corrective lenses that allows us to see the world around us differently. One of the books that, that we use in the, in the small groups for Core 4 is it's called The True Story of the Whole World. And it's kind of a, an overview of the biblical story. And I love that title because it really just captures what I, I think Christians believe or, or should believe about the Bible. The story of scripture provides meaning, not just for those who believe it, but for all of life. This truly is a meaning-giving story that shows us who we are and why we are and what's gone wrong and how it can be fixed, and how it can be made new. All the same plot lines that are in every hit movie and every book that humans have ever made. And I think the reason why we as humans can't get out of that rhythm of telling stories about a time when things were good, and then something went bad, and there's this big conflict, and there has to be this hero who can save the day, and then we get to see how everything is going to be made new. In all of our fiction stories, we can't get away from the fact that this is the world that we live in. A world that's shaped by a good author who had good intentions and we messed it up and he has an enemy who is way stronger than we are but not nearly as strong as he is and that enemy has wreaked havoc but our king is patient and our king is powerful and he is working all things according to the purpose of his plan and we can trust him and we can follow him and we can be brought back to him and one day he will make everything right. That's the world we live in. That's why we see the biblical story truly as the sun at the center of our discipleship. Now, it may be that as I've walked through all that, you're going, okay, yeah, 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 I get that. I've been at Cornerstone for a while. You talk about the story a lot. And the reality is, yeah, yeah, this idea of the biblical story has, has shaped our preaching and teaching the way we've tried to lead you for the last decade plus. As a matter of fact, the series we just concluded, the, the um, Thinking Rightly in a Broken World. I don't know if you noticed it, but we structured that series through the story. Okay, if Paul says in Romans 12 that our minds need to be renewed, what was it? How were they intended to work in the beginning? How has sin corrupted our minds? What has God done through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, to make it that our minds can be transformed? What does it mean to now walk by the Spirit in pursuing that transformation? What's it gonna be like at the end? But I will say this to you again. Uh, to this point, most of what we've done is presented to you. Hey, look at what we, how we've learned to cook this way, right? How we've learned to put together tasty recipes this way. But the thing that I, that's so on my heart, a passion of mine is to say, come join us in this. Don't just watch me or someone else walk through this. Come learn to do this yourself. Do you feel acquainted enough with the structure of the biblical story that now you can take this thing out for a test drive? When you encounter questions you don't know how to answer and you ask yourself, what does the Bible say about this? Do you just Google search verses that have that word in it? Or do you even now take those verses in that Google search and go, okay, 
how do I take these scenes and set them in the storyline? So I see not just what does Leviticus say about this thing, but how does God continue to develop and change and grow our understanding as we go? Remember, that's what we said in that series about the way our minds are supposed to work. God says, come walk with me because he knows we can't handle all the information at once. So he continues to speak to us progressively over time. So that's what we really want to do in Core 4 is, is equip you with a simple framework. This is what we'll come back to next month, um, February 13th. We're going to give you a simple framework, a, a kind of mall map, if you will, for the biblical story itself to help you start to take perhaps you've been walking with the Lord for, for years and years. And again, something that helps you defrag the hard drive of all the biblical information that you have gained along the way and put it in an order that makes it useful and helps you to see the story. You're gonna see, we'll walk through it in kind of these four main um, uh, movements of the story. Creation, how things started. Rebellion, how they went wrong. Redemption, how God makes it new. And that fourth part, or that third part, is really the majority of the Bible. It encompasses all that God did through the people of Israel, all that he accomplished through his son Jesus, all that we now get to be a part of as his church. And then the fantastic conclusion that's really just a new beginning of the story when God makes all things new. We'll walk through that next month. We'll take the first half to kind of go walk through the map and then take the second half of the class to say, okay, let's take this out for a test drive. Let's look at a couple of themes. Let's see the way that this helps us navigate different issues in life, um, which will be really fun. Um, what I'll also do each time we get together is I'll give you some resources. And I don't want you to feel the pressure that you have to dive into these. I know different peop people, the, the, time, the amount of time you have to give to this, um, the amount of joy you get in reading might be different. But again, in an introductory way, what I wanna do is, is get us rolling on this. And if this strikes a chord with you and you go, gosh, I, I don't wanna wait a month. I wanna dive into this right now. I also wanna give you some opportunities where, okay, good, you can dive into this yourself. So if you're interested in this, if you are a, an eager beaver that wants to work ahead, there's kind of three resources that I'm gonna let you go know about next month, but I'll give them to you today as well. And they kind of from left to right go in, in, in uh, level of complexity as well. The one on the left, the big picture story Bible probably looks like a kid's picture Bible because that's exactly what it is. Uh, but I love reading it myself. Uh, I, you can sit down and read through this thing in about 45 minutes because there's about three or four sentences a page, but the, the images are so beautiful and they even try to link the images together so that you see the repetition of patterns over the course of the story. And there's this amazing moment when Jesus, there's a, it's the part where it says that in Luke that Jesus opened his disciples' minds to understand the scriptures and the way that they visibly represent it on the play, page is just so beautiful. It makes Jesus look so beautiful. And um, yeah, oh, it chokes me up even just thinking about it. I won't tell you what it looks like because I don't want to, spoiler alert, but I would highly recommend, yeah. Uh, I, this is one, one of the best things I learned being the children's pastor here for five years. Don't underestimate kids' books. I learned so much from kids' books because they keep it simple. Now, Jean was just showing us this morning this great kids' book that she found that walks through what is the church. And I was like, can we get one of those for everybody? It's, what's that? You ordered a bunch. So if you want a great kid's book that will even help us understand what the church is, go for that one. The middle one, the big story, this is one I'm about halfway through myself. Todd found this resource and used it with a group of guys that he's been walking with. And it's a great kind of, it, it, the, the author wrote it, um, yeah, I think he's in the Silicon Valley area, and he wrote it as, as something that he could use with people that aren't even a part of the church. So it can be something that's a great starter for people who have no background, and yet in that same way will continue to challenge us. Um, and then the last one, the true story of the whole world. This is one where perhaps if you've got a lot of biblical knowledge and a familiarity with scripture, this is one that just really does help you orient a lot of the details in the, in the story. Um, so those will be some resources that we'll be walking through again in more detail on February 13th. One, just apology. I forgot to take into account that the NFL added a 17th game this year. So I didn't even think that the Super Bowl might be on February 13th. Um, and I'll also be honest with you, um, right there at the tail end of the game when Brady tied it up, there was a little bit of part of me that went, you know, it wouldn't be the worst thing if the, if the Rams weren't in it because people might want to still come to the class. <laughs> but the Rams won, so go Rams. It should be cool. But I would just encourage you, yeah, we'll be back February 13th. Didn't mean to, to, to double book it on the Super Bowl, but I, I'll also say no judgment or a legalist, legalism in this. Um, the gospel of Jesus is way more important than football. I'll just say that. Um, and we'll, we'll go for that. So 
Let me, let me pause for questions here and then, uh, and then maybe we'll take a break after that. Any questions, any thoughts, comments when we talk about the biblical story? Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, the true story of the whole world. Yeah, the font's a little bit small up there. The two guys that wrote it are a guy named Michael Goheen, G-O-H-E-E-N, and Craig Bartholomew. Yeah, those are the two authors on that one. And I think, maybe not the kids' book, but the other two I know are available like in digital format too if you wanna do that. All right, now a, a more important question. When you think about the Bible as a story, maybe what, what are some of the, what, if, whether you've interacted with this thought or not, what perhaps is most helpful to you when you think about the Bible as a story? Or maybe what, is, there, is there a question or a sticking point where you go, oh, I struggle thinking of the Bible as a story. Anybody have anything they would love to say in that regard? What's, what's helpful in thinking of the Bible as a story? Yeah, Bob. Yeah. Oh, cool. So well, if you didn't hear, Bob is basically just saying along the same lines that we were talking before that the helpful part is that it does help us to not fragment the Bible into bits and pieces and just individual stories, but to have that sense of the way that it fits together, to have that sense of a, of a flow. Yeah, there's subplots and there's sub characters but it all fits within this, this main idea of what it is that God is seeking to accomplish in his world. Absolutely. What else? Any other thoughts as we get back into this? Yeah, Mike. Uh, true, true, proven, yeah, true, proven, something we can put our hope in. This didn't roll off the assembly line yesterday. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Val. Oh, wow. Dude, that's awesome. I wish, I wish everybody at home could hear what you just said. It was basically, Val was saying that like one, one of the, the, the main storylines that we use is called the hero's journey. The, this hero who goes through this transformative process. He's changed in the process. Like think about Luke Skywalker, like uh, uh, um, Steve was talking about this morning. But in the biblical story, our hero, our God is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is constant and he just continues to unfold more and more, right? The, the changing part is the amount of it that we get to see. God cracking the door open more and more to show us more and more of who he always has been. That's awesome. That's beautiful. Any other thoughts as we jump in? All right. Well, if you have your little booklet, um, again, we're gonna keep going through this idea of the, um, the solar system. And I would encourage you, again, this could be a good reading. Uh, you'll find a lot of this is very similar to what I'm doing this evening. Um, some of the back end is more uh, structure on the way we wanna walk people through it. I would say this, again, this, we, we put this together about two years ago, and I would say about 95% of it is still current. The only different is, difference is that some of our resource lists has grown. Like we found, oh, this is another book. That, and so in, in that way, I think that's actually really helpful that as we, as we walk with people, there's not just one resource that we can use, but almost different ones based upon different uh, levels of where people are at. But the majority of this, you'll see the flexibility is more on the how than the what. The what and the why is steady, but the way that we'll walk people, it'll look different in different settings, uh, which I think is a, is a good development from what, what you see in here as well. Um, the second piece that we wanna walk through is this idea of gospel transformation. So you can see that on page 15 of the book. You'll see this idea of gospel transformation. And here's what we mean. I wanna make this part clear to you guys as we go forward. We will use the idea of the biblical story and the gospel interchangeably, interchangeably. 
Gospel means good news, good news. And sometimes when we talk about the gospel, you, you can think about you know, the, the, the four gospels in the New Testament, the story of Jesus's life. Sometimes people might like, like shrink the gospel down even more to like what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, this idea, I delivered to you what was of first importance. Is it 11 or 15? 15, you're right, yeah, thank you. Um, I delivered you of first importance that Jesus died and was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. That, that, that the gospel is the, the passion work of Jesus through his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. Yes and amen. But if all you have is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and you separate it from the rest of the story, again, it's like, no, I am your father without understanding the gravity of that moment, Right? So we believe that the gospel is expansive. The gospel encompasses the entire biblical story. It's all good news. Good news of what God intended his world to be like in the beginning. The good news, I guess you could say, of how bad sin in our rebellion is, it's good because it points us in the right direction. It's, it's good like having an ache and a pain and you don't know what it is. And so you go to the doctor and he says it's cancer. That's not good news, but it is good and helpful to know what the problem is so you can do something about it, right? It is good news to see, even starting right there, what, what, what theologians call the proto euangelion the, the pre-gospel in Genesis 3.15, when God looks at the serpent and says, there's gonna be enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and his seed, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Why is that good news? God promises a man will come who will fight the serpent. That's good news, right? And so the entire story, the, the, the amazingest, it's not a word, but I'll use it, good news in Revelation 21 of not behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death and crying and pain, and all of it's no more. That is good news, amen? So the entire story is gospel. The entire story is good news. But it is good news that doesn't just help us to make sense of life. It is good news that calls us to transformation and is itself, this book is the primary means that God uses to transform us. So that's what we mean by calling this gospel transformation. If there's one passage that I go to that really just kind of encapsulates what I think this idea of gospel transformation is all about, it's in Titus chapter two, verses 11 through 14. Paul says this, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Yes, we are saved by grace, amen? And look at the very next word in verse 12. That grace also trains us. We are saved by grace and we are trained by grace to do what? To renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That's a transformation, right? You were living this way. The grace of God is training you to live differently. And while you're doing that, you're waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And why do we want him to come back? Who is he to us? He gave himself for us. Again, to redeem us from our lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who they used to live for worldly passions, verse 12. But now they're zealous, they're passionate about good works. The gospel is meant to transform us. The grace of God is meant to train us. The question is, how does God do this? How does God train us and transform us through the gospel? And secondly, how do we join him in that? You can think about Galatians 5, for instance, where, where Paul, on the one hand, lists out the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, and so forth. And he says to us, the spirit is producing his fruit in your life. He does it. It's his fruit. So keep in step with him. Walk by the spirit. There is a call to partnership in this. He produces his fruit in our, in our lives as we walk with him. How do we do that? What does this look like? Well, in the, the gospel transformation part of core four, we emphasize these three aspects that we call the three orthos. The three orthos. And you can see those on the next page there in the booklet. Uh, these might be, this vocab might take a little while to stick, but when it does, it'll be really helpful to you and I'll give you different ways to look at it. Uh, the, 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 that prefix ortho, it, it, it's, it's a Latin root that just means straight or right or correct. Think about an orthodontist. What does an orthodontist do? Straightens your teeth. 
He doesn't fill the cavities and stuff. What he does is he makes them straight, makes them correct, makes them, makes them aligned. And so we're talking about things that, that are rightly aligned in our lives. And there's these three ones that we call orthodoxy, orthopathy, and orthopraxy. It'll be a little bit of a tongue twister at first, but it will be helpful to you. By orthodoxy, you may be familiar with that idea of orthodox, like, in, like whether an orthodox Jewish person or a Russian orthodox church. Orthodox just basically means like, like, like correct or, or rightly aligned, especially in the realm of belief or knowledge. When we talk about orthodoxy within Christianity, we're saying teaching and belief that accords with what Scripture says. It's right belief. It's right understanding. It, God transforms us in part as we do come to understand and believe the truth that he's given us in his word the truth of who he is, of who we are, and so forth. So we are transformed in parts at the, what we call like the head level. So if you, if you have your little booklet and you wanna write that next to orthodoxy, write head. Again, not because our thoughts are contained in our head, but more just, okay, if there's a way to orient this in our bodies, the head level orthodoxy, thinking, understanding, belief, that is a, an essential part of how we are transformed by the gospel. And this happens both through addition and Subtraction, if you will, both by gaining more correct knowledge and by exposing lies that we've believed or even just distorted understandings of something that's true. So that's a key part of it. Then if you move to the little green circle up there, orthopathy, pathy, pathos, we're talking about desire, we're talking about passion, we're talking about delight, both what I want and what I like. This is an absolutely central part of our, of our transformation because we are not, as human beings, primarily thinking beings. We're not just these, as one, guy, one writer says, like heads on a stick, where it's all just based upon what's going on up top. We are even more fundamentally desiring beings. We want things. And as a matter of fact, most often our thoughts and our actions are shaped by our desires, even if we're not able to fully understand it. Like, you ever had that, like maybe you're having an argument with your spouse and you, you, don't have, you can't actually put, on your, put your finger on why it is that you're so mad and you almost have to have the argument to then go, okay, I figured it out. I'm mad because I wanted you to do this and you didn't do it. Oh, oh, so all the anger, all the, the snippiness, all of the harsh words that I was using with my wife was rooted not just in, being a jerk, though I can be that, but it was because my desires were out of line or even sometimes uncommunicated. What sets people up for failure more than we have desires and expectations of them that we never tell them about and we go, if you loved me, you would just know. <laughs> right? Dang. Transformation happens as we start to do some heart work. If orthodoxy is head work, Orthopathy is this heart level work of our desires and our delights. That's a huge part of it. And again, this works both in like an addition and in a subtraction sense. It works both as our desires, like we looked at in Titus, our, our zealousness for good things, godly things grows. And as we begin to recognize the really ungodly, ugly desires in our hearts and start to put water on those flames rather than fuel in them, Right? It's this repentance on all of these, it's repentance. Turning from lies to truth, turning from wrong desires to right desires, or even just disordered desires that I've made my spouse, I've made my kids, I've made my girlfriend too important. They cannot play the role of Jesus in my life. This is an out of order desire and to change and transform in this area, I need to actually subordinate that desire to the desire for God and the things of God, right? Right? So this is another key part of it. And then the last part, where, where often the rubber meets the road, not just in what we think or what we want, but in what we say and what we do. That's orthopraxy, praxis, practice. I guess you could say this is the hand level. Head, hearts, and hands is another way we could talk about this. At the level of our actions, and I would even say, pay attention to habits. What are those things you regularly do without even planning to do them? Kind of like most things that we do on this, Right? Gosh, have I learned a lot about the habits I didn't even know I was forming in the way that I go to this device right here. 
But a phrase you'll hear me say probably more than once over this time is that the habits we form, form us. We are shaped by the things that we regularly do. The things that you regularly do right now that you go, I don't wanna be this person forever. I don't wanna always be doing this. Again, we're, we're just far enough in January now that those New Year's resolutions, like what happened to those? They fizzled out somewhere on the, on the way to forming habits. Or if you're still going, perhaps it's because you actually are trying to not just do the right thing, but build this sense of habit into it. That's a big part of it. This is why, again, all three orthos, I would say, are essential to our transformation. But I would say, here's the, here's the problem. Here's the trick. I believe that one of the ways that sin has corrupted and twisted us is by throwing us out of balance directly in, in relation to these three aspects of who we are. We get out of whack on these three. We start to emphasize one or maybe two and neglect one of them. I haven't met a person yet who's just came out of the womb balanced in these ways. Maybe you're like me, you're more that kind of head type. I love to think and, and study and have conversations about things and at the end of having a really deep conversation about things, I really feel like I did something. Even if I didn't do anything other than talk about it, right? I can struggle sometimes to move what I'm thinking into action. Maybe perhaps you're more of like an, a, a really active type. I, want, I got lists and I gotta get through those lists. Doesn't even matter what's on the list. Sometimes I make a list of the things I already did just so that I can feel good about checking some off already. And it's more about do, do, do. And sometimes you struggle or even you feel really, oh my gosh, you feel really exposed if someone asks you why you did that. Don't slow me down from doing something to ask me why I'm doing it, right? I think we all struggle in the orthopathy side of it. Every single one of us. Either you don't think you have feelings, so you just kind of press them down, like Spock is your hero. Or you're the kind of person who, you're, you're just along for the ride of wherever your passions are at at the moment. You just buckle in and go where it goes. You're, you follow the pinball of, I want this, then I want this, then I want this, then I want this. And part of the rustle in your life right now is you go, I've got to get off this. i got to get off this. Seriously? Like if I am led by my heart and not able to lead my heart, what does Jeremiah say? That the heart of deceptive above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? So if you find yourself always chasing the next thing, the next purchase, the next hobby, the next relationship, understand there's a need for transformation at that heart level. But here's the thing. If none of us are balanced in the three orthos, that means I'm not gonna make much progress in gospel transformation by myself. I'm just gonna steer this right toward the same imbalanced way that I like to operate, and I'm gonna neglect perhaps the thing that I don't know what to do with that actually might be most helpful to me right now. Like this is part of what necessitates discipleship being a group project. That in many ways, especially when you're with people who don't just resonate with the same things that you do, but almost intentionally seek out brothers and sisters who you know are different than you, what you're gonna find in that process, they're gonna help balance you out. They're gonna go, hey, that was really cool how you talked for two hours about something. What are you doing with it now, right? Hey, I, I see you going and going and going. Can I just suggest that perhaps the things that you're doing to help may not be as helpful as you think? Hey, it seems that you don't know how to, it seems that you're just led by whatever you feel in the moment. Can I help you anchor to things that are true whether you, you feel like it or not, right? This is the way that we begin to grow more together. This again is why we wanna walk people through core forward, more of a long-term relational kind of a setting so that when you start to see these imbalances and strengths and lean into each other. Some of you guys are already finding that in your, in your, in your community groups. Um, in, in your healthy marriages and things like that. And it's, and it's beautiful. But you start to, I just feel like uh, more and more start to go, man, I don't wanna try to do these things. As an introvert who likes to do things by myself, I do feel like one of the things that encourages me in my walk with the Lord is, is I see these new habits developing of, hey, before I just go share these thoughts, I should probably bounce them off somebody else and see if they're actually helpful. 
Hey, before I just go do this, hey, is there a better way? Like the way that we involve each other and not just lean on our own understanding is a great way to kind of take your temperature and where you're at in your own discipleship. So again, we'll come back in, uh, on March 20th, in the month of March. So this will be kind of the focus of what we'll do then. Again, we'll walk through these three orthos in a little bit more detail. Um, and then we'll take them out for a test drive. Um, again, whether me or somebody else, they might go, hey, I went through this study over the last couple of years and I, I picked this area in my life where I wanna go. And let me show you how I walked through all three of these elements and kind of give us a, a test drive on some of these things. Um, but that'll be coming up. That'll be our, our, our main focus for that meeting in the month of March. Before I move on to the next one, any thoughts, questions, shouts of outrage before we move on? Yeah, Jeff. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think like in most things, we have a, have a tendency, or what Jeff was just saying is that he sees the three-part nature of this and you just see like perhaps some relation in terms of God being three in one. And I do think that like without over, like without trying to lay the Trinity on top of something like this, I'm not trying to do that. But what I, what I do resonate, I think in what you're saying, Jeff, is just we do have sometimes an, an immature and unhealthy tendency to boil it down to one thing. It's the one thing, just do this. Just read a, read a couple verses and me- maybe memorize them and that'll do it, right? Just, just get up on time and spend some time reading your Bible and that'll do it. No, we need a full-orbed way. And I do think, again, like that sense of a, um, simpl- the, rela- the, the fun relationship between simplicity and complexity, I do think is one of those things that God's woven into this world and into the way that we grow as well. Yeah, good thought. Other thoughts, questions? Is helpful so far? Excited to move in this direction? Okay, me too. I'm excited to go there with you guys. Let's look at the next one, basic doctrine. This one's fun, okay? This is, uh, (laughs) I said fun and some of you guys might be going, oh, this is the one I I don't really want to pay attention to. Here's what I think is so powerful about this. Uh, um, R.C. Sproul, uh, the the, the late, great, theologian, uh, someone that was, I mean, even though way, much older than I am, was really formative for me, even in my teen years, because um, I had guys like Bob in my life who said, hey, you should read these books by R.C. Sproul, which are amazing. But he wrote this one book that was called Everyone's a Theologian. Everyone's a Theologian. Whether you like to study doctrine or theology or not, you operate by it. Your decisions and actions, the patterns of your life are shaped by what you do believe about God and yourself and the world and what it means to be saved. Like, y- you operate according to this, so why not inform yourself so that you can operate a little bit more informedly, right? Here's what you need to understand. When we talk about this idea of doctrine, because doctrine can be a scary word. It can be an intimidating word for a couple of reasons. It can either just sound like intense and deep or dry and stodgy and dusty, or it can almost sound like power. You're going to indoctrinate me. Yeah, actually we do. It, to put sound doctrine from God's word into you, to plant it in your heart and your soul? Yes, absolutely. But in the way that that word gets weaponized as this tool to brainwash? No, that's not what we mean. But doctrine is a good thing. Let me show you two quotes real quick from two theologians that just break down what is this idea of doctrine all about? John Owen, great Puritan theologian, he said this, doctrine is the application of the word of God to all areas of life. To all areas of life. Taking this book and going, okay, whatever situation I'm in, how do I navigate it, navigate it according to God's word? The second one is from Wayne Grudem, a more contemporary theologian, and he just defines it like this. Doctrine is what the whole Bible teaches us today about some particular topic. What the whole Bible teaches us, and I actually think that word today is helpful because we do want to speak clearly today not be blown by the wind of whatever's popular and change doctrine based upon the way we feel. But I do think that the call to study doctrine is, is a call to be both a student of God's word and to be a student of the world that we live in. To know the questions that people are asking, the hopes and fears that they're wrestling with. To know the other competing stories that are shaping the way that people look at life. And to know how to like, interact with that in, in, according to God's story, right? That's what we mean by today, to speak clearly in our day. This is why you read John Owen now, and it's like 
like, like trying to chew on sawdust, right? It's just dense writing because people thought and acted and read it and used English in a different way that we do now. There is a need for contemporary communication of doctrine. But the thing that I love about both of these um, uh, definitions, again, John Owen says, it's applying God's word to all of life. Grudem says, it's taking the whole Bible and talking about a topic. So take those two things. It's all of the Bible and all of life and bringing those two things together in a way that makes things clear today. That's a big task. That's a lifelong task which is partly why we call it basic doctrine. We want a basis for this, right? But a basis, a foundation that's, that's stable enough to continue to, to move on together. Um, but there's also, this is also the reason why, I'm gonna talk about this for a little bit. This is why we put basic doctrine third in, in core four. Not because doctrine is less important than the biblical story or gospel transformation, but because we believe that Doctrine is built on the foundation of the biblical story and gospel transformation. And then perhaps this is something that may be a little bit distinct about us. It's, it's growing within the church, but, but a little bit more distinct about us because there are a lot of churches, a lot of churches that, that I know and respect, that they start here when, in their discipleship of their people. Their, their discipleship curriculum starts with like a fundamentals of the faith type class that moves systematically from, here's what we believe about God, here's what we believe about the Bible, here's what we believe about uh, creation and man and sin and salvation and last things in the church and all that. It, it moves that way. And that's, that's your starting point. Um, but we, again, we put basic doctrine third on this list because we believe that actually the best starting point is the story again. The story is the starting point because that's the way that God chose to communicate doctrine to us progressively over time and not just in in, in statements to us, but in his actions, in his character revealed in his actions in history. So you've probably heard the phrase, don't put the the cart before the horse. Again, if you're unfamiliar with that, if you're a kid in here going, I don't know, Mario Kart? Um, (laughs) Don't put the cart before the horse. It means this. If you flip the proper order of things around, like, okay, the horse is the one that has the strength to pull the cart. The cart's really useful to carry stuff. But if you flip that around, you're not going to be able to take advantage of either the strength of the horse or the usefulness of the cart. It's not going to work well, right? So in that analogy, I guess you could say, we believe the biblical story is the horse and doctrine is the cart, Really useful for us to be able to speak clearly about what the whole, we have such a privilege to live in a day and age where we have the completion of God's written revelation in his word. And now we have the ability to look from beginning to end and go, okay, how do we understand life? How do we load that cart up properly? But the story pulls the cart. Does that make sense? We also very purposefully put basic doctrine after gospel transformation because this reminds us that studying scripture, that that doing theology We always do it as people in need of transformation. We always do it as people in the process of transformation. And that need for transformation even applies to the way that we understand Scripture. Again, not because Scripture changes, but because we're lifelong learners who, if we're honest, we know not only is there more that we don't know yet, but even the things that we know we don't know perfectly. The way that Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13, even now we see as in a mirror dimly. Faithful, God is faithful to preserve his word. We can have what I think is a faithful understanding of God's word, but not a finished understanding of God's word. So even one of the main things we'll do in this basic doctrine study is we're gonna introduce you to the the doctrinal statement that the elders, uh, that I worked with all of our elders over the last, gosh, probably three or four years to put together. We used to have a 13 page doctrinal statement. I think it's about 70 pages now. And the purpose of that was not to overwhelm you. The purpose, again, was to say, okay, how do we think about today the topics that we need to address today? And the reality is Martin Luther and John Calvin, they didn't need to address some of the same questions that we're called to address today. At the same time, we don't have to address, at least in the same way, the same questions that Athanasius and the guys at the Council of Nicaea were wrestling with in the 300s. I'm so glad that they did, and I'm so we have, glad we have a record of, of the ways that they wrestled with God's word to answer the questions of our day. But we stand on their shoulders with the same responsibility to speak today. Does that make sense? So again, we, we want to do that for, with a place of 
knowing that our, our thinking needs to be sharpened, that the, the, the scriptures are meant to be a corrective lens, not only for the way that we view the world, but even for the way that we view the scriptures. We wanna to continue to grow in that way. So the gospel transformation study, again, helps prepare the ground for us to study doctrine, but to always do it in a posture of humility. Here's what we see so far. And not only that, to not feel like we, we, um, we always have to reinvent the wheel. We believe that scripture has unique authority that the tradition of the church does not have. And yet we're fools if we don't pay attention to church history, if we don't pay attention to what our brothers and sisters who went before us have said. That is just such arrogance to think that, no, I, I can just start fresh. So we want to, both in the way we look at church history, in the way we look at the world around us today, I would say in that orthopathy heart sense, the more you study doctrine, if you don't see humility growing in your heart, you're out of balance. You're out of line. And so we want to equip you with both God's story and with gospel transformation first because we think those are the two most useful tools. So that way you don't just take what we say in that doctrinal statement, but you get to join us, I guess you could say, in the doing of doctrine, in discerning scripture. You get to join us in even growing discernment of why it is that Christians often have arguments over what scripture says. And that's a huge part of it. Um, why do Christians believe different things when they're working from the same book? Why do Christians divide over doctrinal matters? Are there doctrinal matters that are worth dividing over? And are there other doctrinal matters where it's actually best for us to be okay with the diversity of opinions, even within the same church family? Are others where, okay, no, probably within a church family, we need to have a little bit more of a shared understanding. And are there others where we say, no, there's a big sandbox, let's play. Right? And the answer to both of those questions is yes. There are doctrines that are worth dividing over. And yes, there are doctrines that we can have a diversity of opinion on. And there are some which we as your elders have said, actually on some of these, we wanna say, hey, this is the way we're gonna guide Cornerstone. Even though we recognize that Christians view things differently. One of the things that we'll get into more uh, when we get to in April to, to the doctrinal sto story or the, the basic doctrine study is the way in our new doctrinal statement, we've built out this idea of primary, secondary, and tertiary doctrines. Again, big words that just mean one, level one, level two, level three. And we don't mean level one, two, and three based upon importance, but more, I guess you'd say, based upon con consensus, agreement. The majority of what we try to put in that document is that if it's, we see it as a primary doctrine, it's because there's consensus throughout the history of the church on this one. On more of the secondary ones, we go, yeah, actually, you know what? There's, there's different opinions and there's actually good reason for it because certain texts can be faithfully interpreted different ways and Christians can arrive at different positions and we can't call each other heretics. We can just say, hey, you know what? Right now we see as in a mirror dimly, but one day we'll see face to face. And I don't wanna get there and see, that's right, I was, I was right, you were wrong. I wanna get there with my brothers and sisters who see it differently and say, yeah, we were honestly just faithfully trying to wrestle with God's word. We gave each other room to disagree. We gave each other room to disciple people based upon those different things. And we get to be one family now. The things that divide us may just may temporarily divide us. And then what are those things that allow us to just say, yeah, you know what, on this one, there's a lot of room, even within the same church. Actually, this is one we need to pursue, uh, proceed very humbly because actually scripture isn't super clear on this one. And there's not many, but there are a few where, yeah, there's a, there's a, a room for a big sandbox to play. And I think one of the things you'll find as Todd and I continue, as we continue to work through the series that we're doing right now in first and second, second th hard to say, first and second Thessalonians, especially we get into chapters five, four and five and first Thessalonians one. A lot of the places where I think there is a lot of room for diversity has to do with what we believe about what it's gonna be like when Jesus returns and what's the complex of events that are gonna happen at that time. We have a way that we try to lead you as a church, but actually it's gonna be fun. That's one of the reasons why I think Todd and I were excited to do these books is to kind of go, hey, we, we, we want to. And, and it'll be a really good way, a, um, a way to take the temperature of our church. How are we doing on that posture of humility on the way that we approach doctrines where actually, yeah, there's a lot of questions that we have. So I'm, I'm gonna flip through a few slides because I think that's probably sufficient to move us forward. But I would say, if you, again, if you're antsy and you wanna jump into it, 
Uh, that updated doctrinal statement is on the church website. Val uh, has just finished um, uh, translating into Spanish as well, which was a monumental feat. You did a great job with it. I don't know if that one, that one's not live on the website yet, but it will be shortly available for our, for our Spanish congregation as well, which will be really great. Um, but you'll see kind of in, in the, the introductory section that we call the prolegomena is where we really lay out what we mean by those primary, secondary, tertiary doctrines. And when we come back in April, that's what we'll kind of dive into more. And we'll take them for a test drive and show you why, especially like on an issue like baptism. When we talk about different questions in regard to baptism, yeah, some things are primary, some things are secondary, and some things are tertiary. It becomes a really helpful one to help us play with these three categories and see how they work together. But any questions on that one before we move on to the last one? Yeah, Fred. Okay. Uh huh. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So what Fred said was, yeah, the, the way that we go about doing doctrine is we don't say, okay, here's what I believe and let me find it in the Bible. We look to God's word first. We look at the, the way that, that even doctrinal issues, topics develop across that story. And then from there, we start to, try to make clear, understandable statements that articulate what we believe the Bible says. That's, that's the task of doctrine. And again, there will be different people, almost like when we're gonna talk about evangelism in a second. There are certain people in the church who are particularly gifted at evangelism and we wanna see them shine and we wanna be willing to follow their lead and allow them to even push us and help us grow in that way. And in the same way, there are people who are gifted in doctrine gifted to wrestle through complex issues with the whole of scripture. Um, and, and they get to serve the church. So this isn't one of those things where everybody's gotta get down to the nitty gritty. But at the same time, I would say this, um, if you are both unwilling to think carefully through doctrine and then suspicious of those who do spend a lot of time in it, you've set yourself up to fail. If you don't wanna dive into these things, nor will you trust those who are seeking to do that as a way to serve you, well, you might as well just get off the train already. But if you're willing to, again, with that sense that there's different parts of the bodies that have different strengths and letting them come to bear to the benefit of building up all of us, then you actually have a lot of room to be able to cheer people on and say, wow, that was really helpful. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, you actually, God's gifted you in that area. You should run with it. And I don't wanna, we have a tendency, this almost gets more into gospel transformation, some of the orthopathy's heart stuff. If it's an area where I don't feel strong, my knee-jerk reaction is to downgrade the importance of it. That's not as essential as the stuff that I'm excited about or I feel good at. And we need to be very careful. There's a huge part of that posture of humility of saying, wow, actually, we, again, part of what we've wrestled with at your elders, as your elders is to go, we believe that all of these are essential. They're all tools you need in your toolbox. But even part of the fun of walking a group of people through Core 4 is you get to see what lights them up. Like what part do they get excited about, right? Like somebody who's slogging through gospel transformation, but then you say it into, okay, let's understand the, the difference between the deity and humanity of Jesus and how people have wrestled with that throughout history. And next thing you know, it's like the 4th of July and they're super excited. That might give me some data of perhaps a way that God's gifted that person. And vice versa, someone who goes, okay, this is, uh, I'm, I'm rustling to wrap my head around this one, but then you get to the really nitty gritty Here's the way you share God's, God's word with those around you and that's where they light up. Like that's what's so fun about doing this in a group where you get to know people is you actually get to see giftedness come to the surface and you get to encourage that in each other and you get to even look at each other and say, hey, can you lead me in that? Can you help me see what you're seeing? Not compete, like I gotta be at the same level that you are, but appreciate that in each other and, and be blessed by that in each other is a lot of what we're going after with it too. Any other questions on that one? All right, last one. And it definitely, definitely not least, mission and evangelism. We wanna hold the two of these together because in many ways, like I said, this is not less important. We've kind of designed it as like the capstone, that last piece that gives shape and holds it all together. And please hear me, 
this idea of mission and evangelism is not just for those who think they might want to be overseas missionaries or want to be street evangelists. Though, if you want to be, if you aspire to be, aspire to be either of those things, please let me know. That's fantastic. We'd love to walk with you knowing that that's a desire that God's put on your heart. But I would say this, every Christian as a disciple called to make disciples is to be engaged in the mission of discipleship, amen? We are all called to be on mission. Again, if that's one that you don't agree with, just get off the train right now. That's where we're going. Not only that, every Christian is called to evangelize, to be a proclaimer, a teller of this good news, not just of, again, like we said, the whole good news of this amazing story. Now, like I just finished saying, some will be particularly gifted in this. Again, whether by passion, opportunity, or effect. They're just the person where, man, you might hear them share the gospel and you kind of go, I could have done a better job. And yet the person they're talking to comes to know Jesus. Wow, amazing. Like Paul said, God ordained that through the foolishness of what we preach, he saves people. That's amazing, right? And yet even those people are the ones we say, okay, help us, lead us. Bring your strength to bear on the church as a whole because we're all called to be proclaimers of good news, right? So the last part of core four, this mission evangelism piece, again, they all come back to that sun at the center of the biblical story. And in this one in particular, we, we kind of say, okay, after everything we've walked through, let's work from the big to the small. Let's work from God to us. And there's kind of three main things that we'll emphasize in this last piece. Again, they're, they're right there in the title for the most part. Mission, evangelism, and calling. And when we talk about mission, okay, we go big to small and we ask first, what is God's mission? When we look at the story, what is the mission of God? And I would say, don't even just start with salvation. What was God's mission in creation? When he made the world, what was he seeking to get out of it? What was his purpose to accomplish in creation? Because I guarantee you this, even though sin messed up a lot, it didn't change the plan. It just introduced a lot of obstacles that God would overcome to still accomplish his purpose, right? And a little bit of a spoiler, the mission of God, one of the places you can see it most clearly is in Colossians chapter one, where Paul talks about how all things were made through Jesus and for Jesus. And not only that, God's purpose was through Jesus to redeem everything in heaven and on earth. So everything in heaven and on earth was created for Jesus, by Jesus and for Jesus. And the purpose is to redeem everything in heaven and on earth. That's the mission of God. Okay, if that's God's mission to redeem all of heaven and earth, how do we join him in that mission? Is our purpose to redeem everything in heaven and on earth? What did we start with? Matthew 28. What's the mission of the church? Make disciples. In God's purpose to redeem everything in heaven and on earth, he has called us as human beings to be engaged in the redemption of human beings. First and foremost, does that mean we don't care about the environment? No, we do. As a matter of fact, the story tells us a lot of how we should care about the environment. But first and foremost, the task that God has assigned to us is to proclaim the good news of Jesus and make disciples of humans. That's gonna be really shaping for what shapes the priorities of the church. I have people in my life right now that if the church could just retool itself to care first and foremost about the environment, they would follow Jesus today. I'm sorry, I don't see that in scripture. I I, I do see a great grand hope for the environment. I do see a lot of ways in which we make it a lot worse. I do think there's a lot that we as Christians could learn about stewardship. But if we retool the church to make it an environmental action league, We are out of step with the story, right? So the church's mission is to make disciples. Okay, then we move in a circle closer. I have it up there and I forgot to go there. How does Cornerstone engage in that mission? The mission of the church is to make disciples of all nations. What do we do as one local church in one nation on earth? And I would say this to you. Our primary calling is to make disciples here in the local area where God has sent us to be disciples who make disciples right here. But secondarily and still essential, we want to be engaged and support and sacrifice and serve to see the gospel go elsewhere, to see it go where it has not gone yet, to support churches and church planting and tribal church planting and church revitalization and coffee shops in the middle of Osaka, Japan that can reach people. Like we want to be engaged in all of that. 
But I do think at times, I, I, I've been around Cornerstone for a while, so I think I can speak to this, and maybe you resonate with this. Have you seen at times where we as a church have kind of just swung the pendulum back and forth? We care about the nations. It's all about the nations. We're just kind of here to make money so we can send money over there. Okay, you know what? No, no, no. We're, we're here. We want to be here. We want to focus here. We want to be a light in Simi Valley. And I, I think my heart, and I know the heart of the elders as well, is to say, let's stop swinging and let's recognize that both. But I do think, and I can speak as, as one of your elders, I believe that I will stand before God by the, by the way that I help to lead this church to be faithful here in Simi Valley first. And I don't want to overlook that. And that all ties to that idea of calling that we'll come to in just a minute. But again, from there, what's Cornerstone's role? And then from there, what is our role as individual members of this family? How do we engage, again, both locally and glo globally as a part of this church? That's kind of the first part. Let's talk mission. Let's talk the big picture mission of God and how we relate to that. Then the second part of that, um, I don't know why I went there. That was not the right spot. When we talk about evangelism, it can be a very intimidating thing, to some of us, it can be a billy club to others of us. Yeah, that's right. Why doesn't the church do more of that? Y'all should be out there at the movie theater with us. <laughs> right? <laughs> Nothing against people who evangelize at the Regal Theater. I, I, I do have an issue with people who, who are judgy judgy about it. All right? But I will say this. If it's intimidating to you or it's something that you hold as, as a superiority thing over you, let's, let's address both of those wrong motivations. And instead, let's go, okay, how do we do this? How do we approach evangelism first as an act of worship? First out of love for God and the amazing grace he's shown us. First out of amazement of who Jesus is and what he's done. Like, people don't have to twist your arm to talk about a movie that you like or a sports team that you like or when you fall in love. Right, I love that line in Elf. Dad, I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. Again, orthopathy is one of the most important tools for evangelism. When our hearts are ignited by love for God, it's, it, we're like Julie Andrews in the Alps. We just break into song, right? When evangelism springs first and foremost out of love and adoration for God, and then secondarily as a way to love and care for others, this now becomes a discipline of delight, not, oh, I know I should do that more. And I'm saying this as someone who I want to grow in that area myself, it comes to bear in all those. We say, okay, now, okay, how do we bring the three orthos together in the way that we care for people? Not just bombard them with truth, but bring truth, but also address the, the thoughts and the desires and the, and the fears that drive their, their actions. How do we help them not just think that Christians judge what people do, but again, set it within that story. We kind of bring all three of them together. And then the last part of it, again, that we really wanna help people grapple with is this idea of calling. Again, as the capstone of this discipleship process, to walk with people and say, hey, as we've walked together, I see the gifts that God's given you. I see them come out of you. I'm, I'm seeing you begin to develop them. Not only that, we've walked through, I see where your life is going. I see the things that you have on your plate. And let's, let's talk about capacity. What, what, what room do you really have so that way you're not a person who takes on more than you can be faithful with, but you take on what you can. Not only that, I, I wanna see us continue to grow in maturity. The... the the church is riddled with shipwrecked people whose abilities advance them beyond their character. And they fell apart because their character couldn't, couldn't what's, the, what's the line from Top Gun? Your ego's writing checks, your body can't cash. We want to avoid that in our discipleship. How do we think through capacity and maturity? How do we think through where God's placed you, with whom God's placed you, or maybe where and with whom my, God might be sending you? how all of that kind of comes to bear in a way where we say, okay, I think we're getting a growing picture of the way you fit in this body, what you bring to it, the way that God's called you to engage in this mission together with us. That's a lot of where we wanna go, but I hope you see, especially by this last one that we walk through, why our goal is not just big intro classes like this, but a more of a smaller group of people over a long period of time, because I really do believe that, that discipleship is like a journey of discovery. I want to discover who God's made you to be. I want you to help me see who God's made me to be. Not just made me to be, but who he's remaking us to be so that we can engage in his mission together. But again, we'll come back in May 15th and kind of wrap up our time together by casting some of those ideas out in a little bit more detail. Um, and a lot of it is just in that, that, 
that desire, what is it? Well, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, that part of the reason why we don't forsake getting together is because part of what we're supposed to do together, we're supposed to provoke each other. Oh, we provoke each other about a lot of things, but in particular, he says that we are called to provoke each other to love and good deeds. And I do think the more that we press into these things together, we see that come to life. We get to celebrate and encourage each other in the way that God's given us, gifted us. And hopefully we get to see us become disciples who are making disciples and see more people brought into this and walking with us. So that's kind of a big picture over this evening to give you a sense of where we wanna go. I hope you're excited about it. My hope tonight was to, if I overplayed anything, it was the why and it was the, this is why I'm excited about this. This is why we're excited to lead you in this direction. And again, don't, don't expect to get all of it tonight. Don't expect to get all of it just over the course of these intro classes. We're, 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 we're putting the primer coat down. And hopefully that will just continue to foster um, this desire of growth in you. So again, at, before we wrap up, any last questions, thoughts, concerns? As you look at these, maybe I'll ask you one that's a little bit more open-ended. As you look at the four, is there one that you go, oh, I'm really excited about that one, and why? Biblical story, gospel transformation, basic doctrine, mission and evangelism. Is there one you're more intimidated by, and why? And would you be so bold as to share that with us? Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> right on. It's Ryan, right? Okay, so what Ryan said is, is like uh, the same answer to both questions. He's excited about the evangelism one because it's an area he knows he wants to grow. And he's intimidated by the evangelism piece because it's an area that he knows he needs to grow. I'm right there with you, brother. I really am. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 So I'm sorry, what is your name? Andrew, so Andrew said is um, that, that he, he really likes the idea of the Bible, the, the story of scripture is the foundation, but he finds doctrine to be intimidating because there is so much diversity and division and so many different churches that emphasize different things and why is it as complicated? I, I, I'm, I totally resonate that one with you on that one too and I think part of the complicatedness is that we are people in need of transformation who for some reason often forget that when we're talking about the word of God. And so we say it's absolutely this way. Anybody who doesn't see it the way that I do is wrong. And I do think there's confidence that we can have. The people that have been most impactful in my life, I, I would say like the, the people that I, I see in my life that I most wanna be like, the two traits that stand out from them in combination is humble confidence. They're not bashful. They don't go, well, I'm not smart enough to know that. No, they, they step in, they try to wrap, they end up, but they do so in dependence upon God. And they do so with a humility that says, I'm still in process. And that's the, that's the kind of character that I wanna cultivate in my life as well. That, and that, that to me makes it less scarier. Not, not not scary, but like, okay, I can start to tread lightly in there because I'm, there's so much room to grow. And I, and I will say that's one thing that really encourages me um, yeah, I just think that's an encouragement to me is when I, when I get to rub shoulders with believers who even have maybe, maybe some significant doctrinal difference than I do, and yet there's grace and humility and brotherhood there. That's like, oh, good. Oh, good, I like this. It feels like family, and family doesn't always agree. But yet, we're, we're united by the Father who brought us into this family. And, and one day, one day we'll see clearly. And that's really good. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, 
I think that there are primary, secondary, and tertiary elements of eschatology. Eschatology is a fancy word that means the study of last things, like the, the, the things that, that will happen at the return of Jesus. So, I mean, long and short, the actual return of Jesus to rule and reign forever, primary, absolutely, absolutely. The timing of how all that works out in regard to what goes on with the world and judgment and the church and all that kind of stuff, that's the place where um, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of room to go, okay, I, I don't think that any of the passages that we have in scripture is to give us a play-by-play. It's to motivate present faithfulness to be about the business of Jesus now. And so I will say, the return, absolutely the return and, and eternal reign of God over all things is primary. Um, and I think that the, the motivation of present faithfulness in the mission of Jesus is also primary. And I could go into a lot more detail, but those are at least a couple I go. Those are absolutely primary. And those actually become the, the anchors that allow us to navigate a lot of the other more, more uh, cloudy questions better. Anything you'd add to that, Todd? Oh, thanks, buddy. Oh, I appreciate that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, just a, a sweet affirmation from my brother, Jeff. Thank you for that, man. Awesome. Well, look at that. Four minutes early. As any of you have heard me preach, you know ending on time is an issue for me. So this is, this is great. This is great. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you that we don't walk just by what our eyes see and ears, our, our ears hear, but we have your spirit to guide us. Lord, we wanna cling to all that you've said. We wanna be lifelong learners. We want a growing humility and confidence to shape our lives as a church. Lord, would you lead us by our grace, by your grace, I mean. Would you lead us um, to, to embrace that idea of being lifelong learners? to be faithful with our time, to not be in a hurry to get it done, to remember that discipleship is a marathon more than it is a sprint, to remember that so often the way that we treat each other and those who disagree with us and those who mistreat us is often the greatest test of our faithfulness to the convictions that we hold. So Lord Jesus, would you lead us in love for you and in love for those around us that we might truly be a light and disciples who make disciples. We ask this by your grace, amen. Amen, thank you all.